How's it going data monkeys? This is Phil from Neuralnet.ai back with another video. If you're new to the channel, I'm a physicist and former semiconductor process engineer turned machine learning engineer. I'm on a mission to train the next generation of data science and machine learning geniuses, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any content. Throughout its history, artificial intelligence has run into several so-called winters. Are we headed for another, or are we in for a perpetual spring break? While some would have us believe that Moore's Law, the doubling of transistor density, every 18 months or so will yield intelligent computers in the next 10 to 15 years, a little basic logic paints a very different picture. You see, this blob of fat between our ears is actually quite the magnificent computer. It's responsible for everything from creating symphonies, discovering quantum mechanics, and even finding humor in death metal kitty videos. It does all this while only consuming around 20 watts of power, less than a typical light bulb. Compare this to modern petaflop scale supercomputers that can't even meme, yet hoover up tens of megawatts of power, and well, you can see where this is going. So what's a nerd to do? Should we give up our dream of an all-powerful artificial general intelligence that is just as capable of writing music as it is discovering the grand unified theory of everything? I suppose that if we're just going to end up with more Justin Bieber pop without the train wreck to gawk at, then perhaps we shouldn't bother. Either way, it's clear that to make progress towards real artificial intelligence, we're going to need new computing paradigms. That's where neuromorphic computing comes in. It's an attempt to more accurately mimic the functionality of the human brain while simultaneously reducing power consumption. To see how, let's back up and review how modern computers work. They use something called the von Neumann architecture, which is a set of discrete systems that are designed for totally separate functionality. Short-term memory and long-term memory reside on different hardware and are both distinct from the central processing unit that handles logic. Underlying the logical and mathematical functionality of these systems are resistors, capacitors, inductors, and transistors. These components operate at incredibly high frequencies, enabling the fancy supercomputers that we use to simulate complex systems. Despite their utility, they are somewhat limited. In particular, they have really high power consumption and very little fault tolerance. If a component breaks, well, you're screwed. If you're not familiar with how processors work, they operate by applying voltages to transistor elements. Beyond a certain threshold voltage, typically of order 1 volt, the transistor gate opens and allows current to flow, and below that voltage the gate is closed and there is no current. This creates a discrete binary classification of zeros and ones, enabling us to represent information and perform all the mathematical operations necessary to process that information. Modern desktop computers can perform billions to trillions of operations per second and store many trillions of bytes of information, all for under $1,000. Okay, maybe a few thousand if you're an ultra-lead gamer. In contrast, the brain is comprised almost entirely of neurons, each in turn made up of a body, the soma, synapses, axons, and dendrites. The soma function as an integrator by accepting signals from multiple other neurons and performing one of a variety of transformations on those inputs and outputting the result to many other neurons. It's interesting to note that these voltages are of order 0.1 volt, an order of magnitude less than in conventional transistors. This power efficiency is coupled to a high degree of fault tolerance and complexity, but partially offset by the fact that our brains operate at much slower speeds in modern processors. Despite these slower speeds, our brains can actually process an enormous amount of information. Instead of discrete on or off states, the, trans the transmission of information in neurons occurs by the propagation of pulsed voltages. These signals are time-encoded, which means their duration is important, as well as their magnitude. Think of this kind of like Morse code, where letters are represented by a series of pulses of various duration. This is called spiking, and it is believed to be a critical component of neuromorphic systems. Another critical component is plasticity. Whereas each component of modern computers has a specific function, the neurons in our brain can change functionality over time. This means, for instance, that neurons associated with speech can theoretically be rewired to help with vision. This can be observed in survivors of a traumatic brain injury, where the brain can rewire signal pathways to recover lost functionality. Incorporating this feature in neuromorphic systems would go a long way towards fault tolerance and long-term reliability. So, how does more closely mimicking biological neurons get us through an artificial intelligence winter? In traditional neural networks, like we use in deep learning, each node of the network sums up the product of its input and the weights from the previous layer, and then performs a nonlinear activation function on the product before passing the signal on to the next node in the next layer. Outputs are compared to some labeled training data, and the errors are backpropagated through the network to modify the weights to reduce the error in classification. 
In neuromorphic computing, the neuron takes pulse signals as input and performs one of over 20 known transforms. One such transform is a leaky integrator where the neuron accumulates the signals with some time-dependent loss and fires when the signal reaches the threshold value, thus resetting the potential of the neuron. While we don't yet have a true neuromorphic computing system, biological systems seem to learn by both formulating pathways of signals in the brain as well as changing the activation of individual neurons. Different pathways are associated with different tasks such as language processing, vision, and complex problem solving. In fact, different functionality can be localized to certain regions of the brain, so a true neuromorphic computing system would incorporate this rewiring functionality as well as the ability to change the activation function within each unit. Unfortunately, our understanding of computing within the brain is still in its infancy, so it's difficult to project how this bottom-up approach to modeling the brain will play out in the real world. With all of these upsides, it seems like we should just build a neuromorphic computer and profit. Of course, the problem with this is that we can't manufacture brains, while a single 300mm semiconductor manufacturing facility can pump out computer chips at the rate of hundreds of thousands or more per day. This raises the question, how can we build hardware that has a low power consumption and high complexity of the brain with the ease of manufacturing of traditional computer chips? As it is done with the traditional computing paradigm, Intel is attempting to establish itself as a leader in this new space. In 2017, they introduced the Loy High Neuromorphic Research Processor. That's a mouthful. It's a 128-core design fabricated on 14 nanometer technology with a total of about 130,000 neurons. Don't rush out to Newegg to buy one just yet, though. There are only a handful in existence, being a test chip and all, but there is a cloud-based platform for access. You can check out the Intel Neuromorphic Research community to learn more. Naturally, other competitors are also working on solutions, however, all of these projects are still in the research stage and it's clear more development is needed. While deep learning is all the rage for the moment, it's not unreasonable to think that there could come a time when progress will slow. At that point, alternative computing technologies, like neuromorphic computing, will have a chance to shine. By more closely emulating the only known model of intelligence, the AI community will have lots of tools they need to continue to push the field even further. We hope. I hope this has been helpful. If so, please leave a like, a comment, and don't forget to subscribe or the robots win. I'll see you all in the next video.